Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Today, we are going to go over fostering the student-teacher relationship in a presentation by myself, Amanda Robbins. This presentation is broken up into three parts, the first of which is the student and teachers as individuals. When I first began teaching, I was a long-term biology sub in New York. A lot of my students were around the ages of 12 and 13 as they were eighth graders. One student in particular was very thin and I suspected always hungry. He had very poor performance in, in class. He didn't have behavioral issues, but he had low grades, low marks. He wasn't doing quite well with the content the way other students were. Beyond this, I was fully aware that he was having problems at home and that these problems at home were affecting his learning. So the question became, how do I help this student? What can I do to help him? Other teachers were also having issues with this student, also noticed his poor performance and were asking the same thing. Our administration did get involved and began to discuss with us what we could do to help him. One suggestion was actually to put him in a disciplinary program, which the teachers were agreeing to, and were putting forth evidence as to why he belonged to be in this program. At this point, and as an early teacher, I spoke up and defended the student and said that I don't think his poor performance is a matter of having more discipline when it comes to learning because again he didn't have behavioral issues but that I actually thought the root of the problem came from his hunger that I thought if we could get him food or snacks something that allowed him nourishment throughout the day possibly this could increase his performance the teachers agreed with me in this attempt and we began to collect snacks and save pieces from our lunch or purchase lunches for him so that he could eat. We also, for his own privacy, made sure that he came to eat in our rooms during our lunch times and our break times so that the other students didn't see that we were feeding him. In the end, his marks did go up, his performance went up, and he was able to learn the content much more comfortably. So I bring up this story because it pertains to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. These are eight tiers of different needs we as humans require. They are broken up into three sections. The bottommost section is that of safety and physiological. These are considered the basic human needs. Under these would fall things such as having food, having shelter, feeling safe in your own home, as well as having water to drink, cleanliness, <clears throat> those basic biological needs that every person needs to feel comfortable in their day-to-day -day life. The second two levels fall under the psychological needs, that of love and belonging, as well as esteem. These ask the individual to reflect on their relationships with other people, whether that's within their family, their friends, their romantic partners, their classmates, or the teachers, as well as their own relationship with themselves. The last set of needs are the top four levels. These are the self-fulfillment needs, and they are cognitive, aesthetic, self-actualization, and transcendence. Cognitive would be looking at our learning, what we want to learn, challenging ourselves in that aspect of feeding the mind information. Aesthetic takes that to a more creative level in which we want to attain beauty. So usually this has to do with decorating the home, having creative projects and hobbies, that's aesthetic. Self-actualization is where we've now have these set of accomplishments and we're aware of our own potential and wanting to feed that potential. 
we want to see what more can we do now that we've accomplished things? What, what else is available to us in the world? And then the last level is transcendence. This is where we've now taken everything we've done in our potential and we think about how can we apply that to the world at large? How do we expand our potential elsewhere to help with large problem solving, understanding our place within the universe, whether that's through religion or philosophy, greater discussion or politics. So that's where you are at the level of transcendence. So now if we take Maslow's hierarchy of needs into the classroom, the level we want our students to be at is the self-actualization level. That is the seventh level in the tier. In order to get through these levels, you don't necessarily have to have every former level satisfied. However, it is good to be en route to having these satisfied. So the reason we want that self-actualization level is because this is the level where we want to learn. We've accomplished things and we want to keep pushing our learning. If you have a student who isn't fulfilling the bottommost needs of safety and physiological needs met, if they're sitting in your classroom hungry, they're not thinking about the subject that you're teaching. Their mind is much more preoccupied on when is the next meal I'm going to have. In the same respect, a student who is sitting in the levels of esteem and love where they're worried about what their peers think of them, their relationship with their teacher, their relationships with their friends or their romantic partner, again, their mind is gonna travel elsewhere and they're going to be distracted by that focus and not focused on the lesson at hand or the subject that you're teaching. So as teachers, we want to evaluate our students to see at what level are they sitting with these needs met and how do we bring them up? What can we do within our power in the classroom to bring them up to that level of self-actualization? Behaviors for self-actualization would include experiencing life like a child. That means looking at things with full absorption and concentration. You're not being distracted. You can focus on what's happening and what's coming in. The second would be to try new things as opposed to staying on these safe paths. You kind of want to take risks and see what else you can do. The third is that you're using your own experiences to figure out or solve problems as opposed to just going with tradition or what's been told to you, because you know what works. You wanna challenge it further and see maybe there's a better way. The fourth would be to avoid pretense. So no game playing, nothing that's kind of social or manipulative in any way. Instead, we wanna be honest. We wanna be very communicative and honest about how we're feeling, what we're thinking and what the feedback is within our own learning. The fifth is being prepared to be unpopular, meaning if you're going to voice an opinion in the classroom and you're aware that possibly your peers won't agree with that opinion, that's okay because in your heart, you know that you're right and you're making the right choice for you and your learning. The next would be taking responsibility and working hard. I think this is something that we often do teach our students, but there's a sense of ownership as well that we want to teach them. How can they own their learning in the classroom? And the last is to identify defenses and the courage to give them up. This more relates to being able to receive criticism and not take it emotionally, but rather logically. Use that criticism to become a better learner. The best way to teach these behaviors are if we, the teacher, exhibit these behaviors. So that's kind of what I wanna get into today in terms of the student-teacher relationship. When I first started learning about teaching and began my teaching education masters, I ended up going to Thailand to observe exactly this. The purpose of this trip was to visit different schools with different funding and socioeconomic backgrounds. Some were private and extremely well-funded while others were quite low income. Some of these schools were in rural areas while others were urban. They were in the Northern and Southern parts of the country and schools were catered to different learning styles, including gifted students, as well as students with special needs or disabilities. What I learned on this trip regarding Maslow's hierarchy of needs is it didn't 
matter so much the different resources that were present. Everybody was human and everybody had the same needs and whether or not those needs were being fulfilled determined how well the student was learning. And that was a very powerful lesson for me because it meant that it doesn't matter what classroom or school you walk into or what country you're in, everybody has the same basic needs. And we can relate with that, we can work with that because we also have those needs. So I'd like to ask, and you can go ahead and share, where do you think most students are on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Where do you think most students sit on this triangle? Does anybody want to speak up? Aesthetic. Aesthetic, okay. Aesthetic is a guess. Anybody else in agreement with aesthetic or have another suggestion? Uh, Self-actualization. Okay. Self-actualization. And for now, when I'm sorry, say that again. Need for love and safety. Yep, need for love and safety. Okay. So it's actually going to be in this bottom, the bottom four levels. Most students are more focused on their daily biological needs, whether or not they're safe and sheltered or feel safe in their school, the love and esteem in terms of looking at their relationships with others and within themselves, most students are working on fulfilling these four levels. They're not always looking much more above that. There are some who do get to cognitive and aesthetic, but most are sitting at the bottom half of the triangle. That being said, where do you think most teachers sit on Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, the other four levels, cognitive, aesthetic, and self-actualization. Exactly, yes. So most teachers are sitting on the other four levels, exactly as you said, that higher tier. We, as teachers, often have already figured out how to satisfy those needs. We're comfortable in our own skin. We're comfortable in our relationships. We have safety and security in our home. We know how to make sure that we're eating, balancing our, our budgets, whatever it is. We have those four levels the base of the triangle sorted. And now we are in those top four levels where we're looking at cognition, we're looking at aesthetics, and we're looking at self-actualization. So I'm gonna ask you, if this is how this relationship is working and we have students on the bottom level and we have teachers on the top level, how do you think they're going to interact? Yes, exactly. We are in uh, different opposite directions. We are traveling in opposite directions. That's right. We are. We're very much disjunct in that sense. We're, we're in different directions, and we need to figure out how do we turn that into a partnership. So I want you to take a moment and reflect a little bit on your own classroom. Where do you think in your classrooms, where do you think most of your students are sitting on this, on this triangle? And then I want you to think about where are you, the teacher sitting on the triangle? And lastly, I want you to think about what that might mean in terms of the students learning, what is distracting them from their learning or inhibiting them? And what does that mean for your teaching? What is helping you or holding you back in your teaching? So take a moment to think about that and then please share. Okay, does anybody wanna, wanna share what they think 
and how they're reflecting on their own classroom. Hi, Amanda, this is Manu. Um, so um, just to sort of share our experience, my experience on this, um, as far as the first question is concerned, where do you think your students are? I think it, it depends really on, um, on what the objective of the class is. So for us, um, we are teaching as an extracurricular for students in a school in Colombo. And um, right from the start, we've told them the expectation is to improve their spoken English. So we kind of um, gave them a benchmark of where they are now and where they should be. Um, so I guess coming from that perspective, uh, I would say in terms of where we want the kids to go and where they are, I, I would say they sit in the, the bottom four in terms of, I guess, safety, esteem. Uh, there's a lot of love in the class. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, in terms of individuals, I think they, um, that's where they sit. And as teachers or educators, we kind of find ourselves in, uh, to an extent, objective driven. So we have uh, certain KPIs in terms of where we want the class to be. So we have the self-actualization and the aesthetic. Um, but generally, since this is more of a, a voluntary basis that we work on, um, we kind of fit into the safety, physiological, and the um, esteem and love part of the triangle as well. So I think that's a sort of a different experience that I want to share. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. That's quite fascinating to hear about as well. Um, and I, I like that you're reflecting on what the subject matter is and you know, the logistics behind the teaching and how that affects the sitting of the triangle. That was very good, very good reflective share. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to share? Yeah, hi, my name is Eugene Young. I am from Colombo Language School and I teach a group of university students from up country, from the States. Um, and I think here, you know, these, these young people um, they are very concerned about their physiological needs, especially, I mean, uh, extreme poverty in, in some areas. But at the same time, um, they try to aim at developing their cognitive needs. And they are aware that they really need to do so. So uh, they are sitting on the first three, but I think they are trying to reach uh, to the top ones also, which is really encouraging to see. And I think online learning now has opened new, new opportunities for them. It has opened new doors for them. No, that's good. That is interesting. And that is something I, I do want to talk about later in this presentation is how online learning has sort of changed a little bit about how we think of the classroom and that teacher-student relationship. So that's, that's nice that you bring that up. But I do agree with you. I do think students want to attain higher levels on the triangle, and it does depend on their age and the subject matter and where they're sitting and living and what's happening in their environment as well. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. So now that we've taken some time to reflect on these needs, the question becomes, what do we do about it? Who is responsible for what regarding fulfilling these needs? How do these individuals with different needs being met interact? And not just the student and the teacher, but also the students with each other. And how do these individuals become a team? So that's what I wanna unpack now in the rest of this presentation. So let's move into part two, the student-teacher partnership. I want to look at these two individuals as two people that work together. The first thing I would like to say and recommend, and something that's very much worked for me, is you start off this relationship by putting yourself in your students' shoes. And what I mean by that is making yourself vulnerable to your students. I think often we as educators, whether or not we intend to, have this perception from our students that we know everything that we have the path forward, we, we carry the map that takes them from novice learner to that final success of graduation. And because of that, they often don't think we can make mistakes or that we can't make, we can't make errors, that we can do no wrong. And the reality is that we can, and we know this. 
So how do we talk about this in the open with our students? The first thing I want you to try to do is actually invite and receive criticism from your students. By doing that, this gesture shows the students that we are a team working towards the same goal. So we want to know what is the student seeing that goal as and how are they seeing us work towards that goal? How are they seeing the teacher helping them facilitate their learning towards that goal? What this does for the student is it motivates the student to care just as much about their learning as the teacher does. That way they know we are a team, which means that they also should be holding up their weight and checking to make sure you're holding up your weight in that partnership. The second thing criticism does is it opens a line of communication between you and the student. It lets them know that they can voice their concerns to you and that builds trust because all relationships are based on trust. So we wanna make sure students can come forward and speak to us. The last thing is it tells the student that their voices and opinions are valued, that we actually care to hear what they think. We want to know if we're doing a good job in their eyes. And that motivates the student to advocate for themselves. That is the first vulnerability that I'm recommending. There's others, but these are the three I wanna focus on today. The second is to admit and apologize when you're wrong. Admittance of the mistake is saying, I can make mistakes, and then apologizing for them is taking the ownership of it as well. In doing so, you're telling the students that you're not embarrassed or too proud to be wrong. And that encourages the student to then take chances, because now the student knows I can raise my hand, even if I'm unsure of the answer, because it's okay to be wrong, because I saw this adult, this lecturer, this teacher, who's supposed to have all the answers, make a mistake. And they were able to save face, which means I can make a mistake and still save face. It's okay to take that chance. The second thing is it does take that ownership of the error. You're saying, I realize I've made a mistake. I'm sorry for it. Let's fix it. If you're doing that, then that encourages the students to also be responsible. And that's one of those self-actualization behaviors you're not putting up a defense. You're not, you're, you're saying, yep, I, I did that, I'm sorry, I'll fix it. And that tells students, yeah, you should, you should do the same. The next part is that you are admitting that you're not perfect and you can make mistakes. And I think that really helps students humanize you and remember that you are as human as they are. You're not this figure that manifests at the beginning of class and sleeps under your desk or whatever it is student thinks we do, but you're an actual living, breathing human being that shares the same emotions that they do. And the third thing is be vulnerable enough to laugh at yourself. I think laughing at ourselves is one of these psychological things we do naturally in social situations to create interpersonal relationships. So why not bring that to the classroom? By laughing at yourself, you're showing that you are secure in your weaknesses. So if you did make a mistake or you trip or you slip or you use the wrong color or maybe you come into class that day and your shirt's on backwards, it's, it's funny, it's okay. And you know, if you can make a silly mistake like that, then that encourages students to be confident when they make silly mistakes, that it's okay, it's fine, we're all human. Secondly, it reminds them that life doesn't have to be serious all the time. I think in a full day of school, there can be a lot of pressure put on students to perform, to achieve, to have a success. They're constantly being monitored, graded, given back feedback, and it can be quite tense. So if you're able to have this moment of laughter, it sort of relaxes that atmosphere. And again, it reminds students that you are relatable. Lastly, it does help break down barriers. It helps, again, ease that tension and show that we can laugh at something together. We can share that joy. And that reminds students that we are similar. So as we begin this process of building the partnership, we are 
first, yes, reflecting on those needs, but also trying to think about, okay, how do we put ourselves in our student's shoes? So this is really looking at more of those psychological needs of esteem. This is what we're trying to help them with, is having that, that esteem and teaching self-actualization behaviors. Okay, so as we divulge further into this partnership, and we look at these vulnerabilities, I do want to discuss who owns what within the partnership. When, when we open up these vulnerable conversations and we ask for criticism and feedback, what are we, what are we really trying to do with this? So by inviting students in with receiving and accepting any of their criticism, we're asking them you know, to reflect a bit on their learning. So we asked them, what was challenging about today's lesson and what was easy about it? What did you like and what didn't you like? And even take it a step further, why did you like or not like that part of the lesson? Is it because it was easy? Is it because it was fun? Is it because it was new? What made that so great or so terrible for you today? Maybe do some scaffolding with it and say, how does this relate to something you learned in the past, whether it was with a previous teacher or subject or within the unit itself? And how would you like to learn the next part of that unit? When you ask students to reflect on their learning, they take on that ownership of, I have to pull my weight in this too, and I'm allowed to speak up about it. So by inviting that criticism, you're actually also allowing them to be vulnerable in the sense that they get to reflect on their own learning and voice to you what they think they need and want. On the other end of that is the teacher ownership, which is asking them to now reflect on the teaching. How can I, the teacher, help you learn this subject? How can I better facilitate your learning? What am I doing right and what am I doing wrong? So you can start by saying, was this a fun lesson? Or was it a challenging lesson? Did I teach this too quickly or did I go too slow? What did I explain that really didn't need to be explained? And what did I explain that I could have talked about a little bit more? I could have stayed with that subject. Ask your students this because again, you're putting yourself in this vulnerable position where they're able to give their voice, say their concerns and talk to you about what it is that's working and not working. So the question then becomes that this is great when you think about it in theory, but in reality, where does this even happen in a lesson plan? And what about the discrepancy between older and younger learners? How do you have this conversation with the different age groups? So I'm going to share a couple of stories. The first is when I was working in South Africa and I was working with undergraduate students. They were international, so they were coming from all over the world, UK, Canada, Australia, different parts of Europe, um, and they were with me in South Africa. I had to take them out into the field and introduce them to different environmental issues or conservation issues. So. We, we did a lot of hiking, a lot of experiences with wild animals. And because of this, the students paid for these experiences. So on top of that, there was not only the pressure to take them out and make them feel safe, but to also be aware that they paid for these experiences or their universities paid for these experiences. So one of the conversations I really needed to have with these older students who were aware that they had to take ownership of their learning is, what did they expect and what did they want from my program? And more importantly, how could I deliver that to them as, the, as their teacher? So the takeaway here is making sure that they, the student, understand their goals. So you want to ask, when, when you ask them what do they want from this experience, you want to first reassure them that they will receive what they're asking for. If you've already planned it in, tell them, say, I'm glad you said that's what you want because that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it today. We're gonna do this in a couple of days. By the end of the unit, you will have what you're seeking. If that doesn't work, find a way to build it into the lesson. And lastly, if you can't build it in, then find a way to compromise with that student. 
what can you do if, if you can't give them that? Often my trips would get canceled because of weather or there was issues with traffic, issues on the business side, whatever it was, and we couldn't always do all the things that were planned. So I had to come up with other ideas, other subject matter, or shift around my schedule and instead use a rainy day for a lecture day when really we were meant to be out doing interviews or whatever it was we were meant to be doing that day. But you find a way to work with them. You explain to them that this is a fluid learning, this is a fluid experience, and we can shift and change that plan to help meet your needs as the student. So that works with older students. But now we want to talk about the younger students, the little students, the ones who are around 10 years old or younger. And maybe they don't really know what they're supposed to be doing or what they're supposed to be achieving. They might still be trying to figure that out or they don't know how to voice this. They don't really know how to self-reflect yet. So these are, these are the kinds of kids where we have to teach them what that means and why it's important. So in my early days of teaching, I did work with very young students through pubescent students. And many of them were mixed learners. They were coming from different backgrounds or they had different needs or disabilities. And some of them I actually had the privilege of working with when they were quite young, around nine or 10. And then again later when they were about 13 and 14. So it was quite nice to watch them grow. And what I found is that there are techniques that you can use with younger students and you can continue to use it until they're older students. And it works just as well. So I'd like to share one of those techniques with you. This is, I call it my palm to chest self-check. So what you do is you ask the students to place their palm on their chest. And then you explain that they have a scale of one to five with one being not very good or least confident and five being very confident or very good. And you ask the student on that scale of one to five, how confident do you feel about the subject that you learned with one being not very confident and five being very confident. This allows for the student to have that moment of self-reflection. They can communicate to you. It's very quick, so you can do it anywhere in the lesson plan. It's easy, so you can do it with any age group. It also retains privacy. So if the students are feeling a bit weird about admitting that maybe they don't like a subject, their hand, their palm is on their chest. It's quite difficult to look sideways at your peer and see what number they're holding up. So it does give a sense of, of comfort there if that is something that they're worried about. Now, when you receive these numbers from the students and you're looking around at your class, let's say the majority of students have fours and fives, and just a few of them have one, twos, and threes. Well, that's great for you because that means as the teacher, you're doing a good job of teaching the subject. You're seeing that the students are reflecting on their learning and they're saying, yes, we get it, we, we understand. Now, for those students who are struggling regarding their ownership, they need to step up a little bit and think about, okay, why, why am I not learning this? And you as the teacher can also think about what's going on with this student that they're not picking it up. Which need do they need help being met? What's happening here? And you can go in and help them. You can target those students. On the flip side, however, if you're looking around at your classroom and you're seeing the majority of the kids are holding up these ones and these twos and they're not very confident and there's only a few fives, fours, and threes, then that means on your ownership as the teacher, maybe you're not teaching this as best as you could. Maybe there's something going on where you have to adjust your teaching style or your pace, or maybe the content is too advanced and you have to break it down differently. On the student side, for those students who are advanced, who are getting it, and who are probably going to get bored if you have to slow down or break it down further, we need to ask them to be patient and it's a great opportunity to ask them to help you, to help you reach out to the students who are struggling, see if they can't come in and, and help you teach a little bit about that subject. So the key thing to remember with this exercise is that your student's success is your success. If they're succeeding, then you're teaching correctly. And 
if they're failing, then that means there's something that has to be adjusted with the teaching. So we talked a little bit about receiving the criticism and taking the ownership, but now I wanna talk about that last vulnerability and that's about being able to laugh at yourself. So I have two quick stories here. The first is when I was serving in Ecuador as a Peace Corps volunteer, you know, there is a, a sense of Peace Corps volunteers. We, we come in and we're looked at in almost a, a sense of celebrity. Here, here comes this, this Peace Corps volunteer. They're going to come and help us and they're gonna teach us. And that's quite a lot of pressure as the individual who is that Peace Corps volunteer. Cause at the end of the day, I'm just another human. I'm just another teacher. So it does put some pressure on you. On top of that, I'm foreign. So I'm walking into this South American classroom, not looking at all like anybody else in the classroom. I speak differently. I have an accent. I eat different things. I dress differently. Everything's different. On top of that, I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, but I'm not a native speaker. And now I have to speak in front of this classroom of people that are native speakers. Chances are I'm gonna make a mistake, whether it's grammar or pronoun, there's something that I'm gonna make an error with, okay? And of course, they're going to love laughing at me for making that mistake or for the weird things I do because I come from a different country. It's gonna be funny for them, definitely. I had a similar experience when I was demonstrating for the first time at the University of Cape Town. I had undergraduate students, their first, second, and third year biology students, and many of them are coming from the different tribes in the country. There's about 11 different tribes present. So their names are very tribal, their cultures are very different, and a lot of times they speak with clicks in their names. And I had an extremely difficult time pronouncing their names because there's different types of clicks you use in the mouth. So there's all different things that you're doing. Beyond this, it had been 10 years since my freshman year as a biology student. So I was also needing to refresh myself on the content. So chances are I was going to make a mistake. So now you have this American and South African university and I'm trying to teach. And of course, I'm going to get laughed at when I say the names wrong. So in both of these situations, Ecuador, and South Africa, I definitely was laughed at. And I had a choice of how I could react to being laughed at. I could be upset and discipline the students and say, you'll not laugh at me like that and lay down a bit of a law there and say, that's not okay, that's not fair, I will be respected. That was an option. I could pretend it wasn't happening and just carry on and not address it at all or I could laugh with them. So I think we all know that I chose to laugh with them. And in doing so, I learned a couple of things. The first thing I learned was that I'm not the smartest person in the room. In fact, no one actually is the smartest person in the room because every individual in the room can teach everybody else something that they don't know. And that's a very powerful realization. Secondly, in order to gain respect, I needed to give respect. I couldn't just walk into this classroom and demand it because I'm the teacher, I'm the Peace Corps volunteer, I'm the foreigner. No, I needed to give them respect in order to gain that respect. Third, letting those students laugh and then me asking them, well, what did I do wrong? Can you teach me? How did I say your name wrong? Or how did I have my sentence structure wrong, that's extremely empowering for a student. To be able to tell this, this Peace Corps volunteer or this American or this teacher to come in and tell them, yeah, this is how it works. This is how it works in our culture. This is how it works in our city, in our school. This is how our language is spoken. That's powerful for them, especially when I receive it and say, thank you for teaching me that today. And I acknowledge that they can teach me something, that I don't have all the answers. This is how you build those connections. You invite that trust because I was vulnerable enough to let them laugh at me and teach me something. 
once those connections are built, the next thing I learned is disappointment is actually much more effective than disciplining. When you discipline someone, it, you know, the message is heard, but it almost creates this sense of betrayal, a sense of hostility, kind of like, I thought we had this connection and now you're, you're shouting at me or you're disciplining me in some way. But if you have a disappointment, that's a lot harder to contend with. That's something you really want to rectify. If you are the person disappointing the other person, you want to fix that. So if my students disappointed me and they saw that I was disappointed, chances are they worked a lot harder to fix that relationship with me by improving whatever it was that they had to improve or fixing whatever behaviors it was that, that they were acting out with in order to fix that relationship with me, as opposed to me yelling at them and giving them detention. And lastly, when these teachable moments present themselves, when you have that chance to have that cultural exchange or talk about, well, at, in my house, this is how I learned to do this, or this is the, the version of the story I heard, or this is my opinion. When you have that moment to have that teachable, that teachable time in the class, maybe you didn't plan for it in your schedule, but that's okay because it's more powerful to have the moment and unpack it and give space for that relationship to grow than it is to say, ah, oh, okay, and put it aside and carry on with the lesson plan. So take time for those teachable moments. So we've talked about how putting yourself in the student's shoes allows for vulnerability and how that truly initiates the student-teacher partnership. But we've talked about it very much in this space of things that happen either at the beginning of the lesson or at the end of the lesson or quick little checks in between. That's sort of what we've talked about. So now I want to talk a little bit about how can you put yourself in your student shoes? Do you agree with any of the activities I've suggested? Would you try any of them? Are you already implementing these in your classroom? Or what other ideas do you have that maybe I haven't mentioned yet? Would anybody like to share? Having food with them during the interval. Do you like to have food with them to share like a snack? Yes. That's nice. That's a nice way to go, especially in recreational times. I like that. Would anybody else like to share? We have to show the students that we are equal to them or inferior to them. Like sometimes we have to act like we are fools. We don't know anything. Sometimes we have to act and make the children motivated that they can do it better than us. That's nice to kind of have that, you know, I can be silly or let them correct you. And I like that. That's quite fun, especially for the younger learners. I think that's very empowering for them. Yeah. We have to add humor in our yes. lesson. Definitely, definitely add humor. What about playing with them? Yes, absolutely. If you can incorporate play, we actually have in the US a day of play. And so all the schools nationwide are supposed to not have any lecture that day. So kids come to school and they play all day. So maybe you set up stations for them to play at, or you just let them have free play all day. But playing is exactly how children learn. So it's very, it's very nice to have that day of play. So I definitely agree with you. Incorporating play into the lesson is, is really powerful. And I suggest, uh, Amanda Robinson, you know, but our directors, ISAs, they don't want us to wear student shoes. Even the parents like the teachers to be strict, and they don't uh, they they don't like the teachers who are very humorous or act like a fool. I mean, like 
that is a strategy where we can use like acting like uh, that we don't know anything so the teachers no the principals or the higher officials they mm -hmm. don't let us to allow the students wear the student shoes yeah that is the pathetic situation of the society and it's in dilemma you know yes no i do hear you i think when you're faced with that that's when it's it's nice to maybe ask students more for their opinion or to ask students what can i do to help you when it does have to be more of a serious nature i it does sadden me to think that that is how how it's expected to be but i think there are ways you can still relate to your students whether it's through sharing stories asking them for stories things like that it doesn't always you can retain those strict and you can retain those disciplines in your classroom but you can still relate to them through communication so even if you can't incorporate humor and play the way you would like to um, there are other ways that you can still have that communication with them and have that feedback. Okay, so I'm going to go how ahead. About, and, yeah, hello? go ahead. How about yes. arranging a musical party with them? Because I do once a month with them. They dance uh, the way they want and they forget everything. Because uh, in my classroom, they always like to dance with the songs they like. That is not appropriate uh, in school sometimes, according to words and uh, what, he, uh, what the lyrics, meanings with the lyrics, uh, the school don't uh, accept those songs. But I allow them to bring songs and you can dance for an hour and you can enjoy and go home. And next week you have to do your all the works very neatly and cooperatively. Another thing yes. is, uh, I, what I do is in the morning, before I go to classroom, I go always uh, half an hour before the time then I'm talking with them and uh, listening to uh, rumors what they say what are the what they say about other girls and uh, other thing is I do a clap with them and uh, giving a hug them I'm hugging them okay so then uh, they very like for that they love to hug yeah. teacher teacher yeah. hugging me teacher smells good and teacher hugging me they like that very much so we have to give the feeling like uh, we are their second mother. So they like it. I have girls class. So uh, I do that also. And I uh, made a rewarding system also at the classroom and I made a dream line. So I asked them to put their dreams on a board and make their own dreams and maintain the dream daily. So they talk with me now. They are trying to achieve their dream now uh, during the class time they like to visit me and they say everything they want to know and they are sharing everything at home and uh, they are sharing all the uh, miss uh, mischievous things and others do what some are uh, on a adolescent stage and they are having uh, that uh, some romantic feelings they have how they uh, react that so I can uh, attend them uh, before they get connected to boyfriends and girlfriends. So it helped me very much. No, I do like that. It sounds like you have a very lovely relationship with your students. And I very much enjoyed the dream board. I think that's a really nice way to have them look at their goals and, and move forward with them. That's very cool. I once it can be uh, changed. Uh, it can be maintained. I ask them to keep your dream beautiful day by day. You have to update your dream. You can change your dream. You are you are you are willing to go to going to be a teacher this year. You are planning, but you can be change it next year. You are going, you can be a software engineer. You have to maintain the dream and learn according to that. Because in Sri Lanka, the career guidance is much. Uh, it's not included in the syllabus, local syllabus. Yeah. So they must have the candidate. Beautiful. No, I, I do like that too, because dreams can change and shift as well. So that's very good. Very clever. Thank you for sharing today. Okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about how we incorporate this in the beginnings and the ends and peppered throughout the lesson, what about the rest of the lesson? What about the actual act of teaching? 
how do we build relationships there? And this is, I hope, addresses some of the some of the questions we had and suggestions with play in the classroom, as well as what do we do when we're expected to be more strict by our own superiors. So the next thing you can do is you can put the students in your shoes. That may sound scary, but I will explain now what I mean by saying that. By putting the students in your shoes, what I mean is that the best learning occurs through teaching, not so much testing. I think you as teachers find that you are masters of your subject and you have to be because you teach it. And every time you teach it, you might learn something new about that subject. You, there's something, you have more comfort with it. You, you have more mastery with it every single time you teach it. Now imagine giving students the opportunity to teach. If students have that opportunity to teach the subjects that they're learning, then they will reach that mastery a lot faster than if they are simply told, okay, at the end of this, you need to take a test. So what are the differences here when we say learning through teaching versus when we teach students to pass a test? So with learning through teaching, it's about quality over quantity. They're trying to learn something, create it, explore it in a qualitative manner versus with the test, they're just trying to hit a number of correct answers on the test. It's more quantity over quality. Secondly, by learning through teaching, students are being able to cater their learning to their styles and design whatever it is that they, they create at the end of learning that lesson. It's very individualistic. Whereas with the test, it's standardized and it's one size fits all. These are the questions, you must answer them, the end. The other problem is often with tests, you can't always say what you want the questions to be. So a student might read a question, misinterpret what it's asking of them and give a correct answer that fits within the content, but it wasn't the correct answer for how that question was being asked and therefore they lose points. And that's quite a shame because they actually do know the content. The third factor is by learning through teaching, students have a sense of autonomy. They can self-reflect on their learning, they can work on that learning and they take responsibility for that learning because at some point they're gonna to have to teach what they're learning. So it's, they need to make sure they have it because they don't wanna seem foolish. That comes right back to that esteem need on the Maslow's hierarchy triangle. On the other side, when you're teaching students to pass a test, their reliance is more on you and the greater powers of that test, whether it's standardized by the province or the government or the school or the university, their reliance is more on, okay, I need to show the university or the school that I can pass this test, which isn't the same as saying, I need to take responsibility for the mastery of this content. It's different. One is I need to learn so that I can teach. And the other is, I need to strategize to pass the test. It's different. Lastly, by learning through teaching, you're allowing the students to have the chance to show you how they think and interpret information because they're going to teach it. So they get to show you and that's a beautiful insight as a teacher because now you know, this is my visual learner. This is my auditory learner. This is my learner who struggles with reading and writing. This is my learner who likes to do presentations. This is my learner who likes to do speeches. You get to learn more about your students and their learning styles. When you are teaching for the test, instead you are telling the students, this is how to think, and this is how to interpret information, and that's how you pass this test. So you're not really doing them any services by doing that, because at the end of the day, they're strategizing, as I said before, but the information you're receiving is a percentage of failure or success, and it's not a true reflection of what they actually know or how they think. Again, it could be that they misinterpreted 
a question. Maybe they came in tired and hungry that day. Maybe they're stressed out because they have other exams that day. Whatever it is, there are other factors that could affect the way that they take that test. And that's very different to being in charge of your own learning and showing what you learn in the way that's most comfortable for you as the student. So that is what I talk about when, I, when I'm saying, let the student be in your shoes, put the student in the teacher's shoes. So ways that you can do this, you can have them form portfolios or blogs or vlogs instead of taking tests, you can assess them by having them create something like a poster or maybe a comic book that goes through the details of the history lesson or the concept that you taught, or maybe it's you know one of the biological systems, they can show that as a visual. Maybe they wanna give a speech or a presentation like I'm doing right now with a PowerPoint. Maybe that's how they feel comfortable is speaking to the rest of the class or to you and showing you how they, how they learn what they understand through speech. Maybe they wanna work with a group and do a performance or a demonstration and put on a play or, or show you, you know, this is how when you mix these two things together, it creates this color or it creates this texture or whatever it is. Or maybe it's very simple. They just have a project. They create a little diorama or they write a report for you. They put something together. Either way, these are all ways that you can assess a student's project at the end of a unit or a concept or a lesson and have them produce something that shows you their learning. They can present that learning to you or to the class or through a report or through a speech or however it is, but they get that opportunity to master the content and teach it either by producing something or performing something. What's great about these styles of assessment as opposed to having them sit down to a uniform test is that it allows them to reflect on their learning. It allows them to have creative problem solving and it allows them to have that, that sense of content mastery for themselves. They can identify what haven't I included in the project or the demonstration or my speech that maybe I'm not feeling comfortable with. Okay, I need to go back and learn and fix that and make sure I know it well so that when I get up there and I teach this to my classmates, I do a good job. Okay. So something we can do within the lesson itself, and that's not an assessment, is while you're teaching kids, you can have these summarized learning moments. That's how I like to refer to them. So you can have a chance where you ask the student to take a definition or a concept and summarize it quickly in their notebook or on a piece of paper in their own words. If you told them, you know, the definition of this word is this, tell them now you write your own definition. Don't copy word for word what I said or out of the textbook, you write the definition the way you understood it. Let them take that on and rework the concept in their own mind and in their own words. Another idea is, let's say you're teaching something new and it has four parts to it. Why not put your students in groups of four and have each individual learn one of those parts and then come back and share it with the other three group members? Just that one part. And then the second group member can learn the second part of whatever that concept is. And then they share it with the rest of the group members and they go round robin all the way around. So each group member learns something and shares it with the rest and then learns the other parts from their group members, okay? That also is very nice because it creates a form of bonding within the classroom. Lastly is you can have them keep a reflection journal. So maybe as they're learning, they can write down what it is that they've learned, how they feel about that learning, and maybe look through former entries to check the progress. How, how have they continued with this? Do they like the subject? Are they struggling? What's going on? It's, it's a nice, quick little five minute activity that they can do at the end of, of learning something or as they're about to learn something where they can reflect on how, how am I behaving with this information? However, we don't live in a dream world and the reality is we will have to test. We do have to have tests. So what can you do to incorporate some of this into testing? Try and make the questions critical thinking questions, questions that revolve around critical skills. 
Also try and have questions relate to self-reflection. Try and design questions that aren't just multiple choice or one quick answer. Maybe have something that allows them to tell you on that test what they know about a subject, whether that's through an essay, through having them compare different events, let them pull from their former knowledge and try and show that to you on the test. See if you can't be a bit more creative with how you ask those questions so that you can get students to think and reflect on their learning. So I have another story. I was for a time a teacher aide for students with special needs. And among them, I had a student who had come from Puerto Rico. Because he came from Puerto Rico, he could not speak English. So he had a language barrier with most of his teachers. And that's why I went around the school with him so that I could translate for him. However, on top of that, he struggled to read and write in both Spanish and English, which was challenging because it was difficult to, to copy over assignments and projects and instruction for him because he was struggling to read and write it no matter what language it was in. He also had a hearing impairment and there was a lot of instability in his home living situation about whether or not his family was going to stay in New York, move to another part of the state or head back to Puerto Rico. So this student had quite a lot of needs on, on Maslow's chart that, that needed to be considered. Now, what happened with this student was he was administered a standardized exam by the state and we gave him the copy in English and in Spanish. And of course he struggled. He struggled with the content. He struggled with the reading and the writing of the exam. And on top of that, there was a lot of issues happening at home about packing to leave and not. So he had missed a lot of days of school and missed a lot of the concept learning for this exam. In this exam, I, he ended up breaking down and actually crying and he was very frustrated and this was even further embarrassing for him because he was a high school student so i had this opportunity to either take the exam away and say okay it's done like we're, we're not going to continue or i could have sat there with them waited for him to finish crying and then encouraged him to keep going but I didn't do either of those things. Instead, I said to, to him, I said, listen, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about this exam. And I told him, you are not stupid. You are not dumb. This exam is not a reflection of you or your ability as a learner. This exam is a reflection of me and my ability as a teacher. This exam and the score you produce on it is going to tell me whether or not I'm teaching you the content correctly. That is what this exam is going to do. And I said, so if the numbers of this exam come out low, that's my failure as your teacher, not your failure as the student. I also told him that I needed him to keep in mind that all of his peers had advantages that he didn't those being that they could read and write in English, those being that they could understand the content because they had more time to learn it, those being that they didn't have the hearing impairment he had, and those being that he was living in a new country, in a new space, a new culture with different foods and different people that he had only just arrived there. And now there was talk about whether or not he was gonna go back to Puerto Rico or stay in New York. And that's quite a lot of stress and pressure to have on top of just the stress of that exam. And I told him, you have all of this that you're contending with alongside the simple stress that everybody else has about passing this test. And I told him, for that reason, you are the strongest student right now in this room being faced with this challenge because you have the most challenges to overcome. So, having that little teachable moment with him and that chance to speak, you know, he gave me a nod, he wiped his tears, he finished the rest of his exam. He did not complete it, nor did he pass it, and that's fine, but he was able to hand it in with dignity. And he was able to walk out of that classroom that day, knowing that his self-esteem was not going to be crushed by this standardized test. 
So that is something I always like to keep in mind with students who, who do get this defeated feeling with exams is that exam is not going to, to defeat you for the rest of your life. That exam, it's a moment, it's not forever. In having that conversation with the student and conversations I like to have with my students in general is yes, we as teachers are aware that not everybody is going to pass. Not everybody's going to have that, that opportunity, unfortunately, but we can teach them other things that they can take with them into the world, into the real world. And those are called transferable life skills. These include learning how to manage your time and organize, learning responsibility and ownership, accepting criticism and being honest, building and retaining your self-confidence, being able to communicate, being able to read and write, critical thinking and problem solving, and actually learning how to learn and how to study. We can teach these things regardless of the content. These are things that come through the lesson no matter what. And these are tools that our kids can use when they leave our classrooms, whether that's in the next classroom or the next phase of life, it's academia, it's professionalism, they can take this with them and leave the classroom feeling successful because they still learned something in your classroom. And many of these you'll notice echo those self-actualization levels that we were talking about earlier in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if we look at a lesson plan and we want to put this all together, what does that lesson plan look like? So I often break my lesson plans into four parts. There is an opening that's usually a warm up or a review. There, um, the example for that would be if we were learning vocabulary, I would probably want to review vocabulary from the last time from the last session that we had by maybe playing a memory game, something like that, that's sort of fun before I introduce the next topic. And that would be the descriptive words for that day. So the transferable skill that this allows is scaffold learning. If I write all the words from the last lesson on the board as a warm up, and then have students go up and I read a definition and they quickly have to slap the board and hit the correct word before the other student does, that's a fun, engaging way to make sure that they know their words and definitions and have a good review and warm them up for the day for the next set of vocabulary words. That brings me to the next section, which is the exploratory phase. So this is where you introduce new content, but without lecturing about it. So instead, you give students the opportunity to investigate and understand it on their own first. So an idea for this would be if we were learning descriptive words, I would have stations set up around the room of different sensory items. Maybe I have a piece of sandpaper in one station, and then I have um, a candle, not lit, but just a very smelly candle in another station. And then I might have something that's um, like a like a ice, like ice water, something like that. So these are sensory items. So now the students can go around and see these items with the word next to them, and they can come up with the definitions on their own. They can feel the sandpaper and say, this is kind of rough. Maybe the word is rough. Maybe it's coarse. Maybe it's scratchy or itchy. And they can try and figure out, you know, what is the definition of this word that's next to it? This allows students to have that time management of understanding how much time they have for the activity. They get to learn how to learn. They're working on their writing and they're using critical thinking. Those are the transferable skills they're gaining from that. The next part of that is the discovery section. That's where I would then have students tell me what they think about what they've learned. And then I can provide them the correct answers if there are misconceptions or further detail and information. I can say, yes, you're right, or no, that wasn't quite what it was. So if we are continuing with this descriptive word lesson plan, that would be to ask the students to come back to their seats, partner up with someone. I often let students pick their own partners, but you can have them partner up however you'd like, and then have them compare their guesses of those, those definitions with each other. See what they think, have a discussion about it. And then once they're done, I can go around the room and ask each pair, what do you think the definition for this word is? What do you think the definition for that word is? And then I can correct it or not. 
This allows students to have the transferable skills of being able to bond and form relationships with each other, learn how to work together. They can accept criticism from both each other and from me as the teacher, and it helps them build confidence because again, they're taking that risk of, I'm not really sure if this is the correct answer, but I'm going to put my hand up and give it a go. So that's quite nice. How do you close this? We would close it with, I like to do the self-reflection and have some kind of feedback. So for me, with an activity like this, because there was so much activity and movement, I would do the palm check and ask them, what was your comfort level? Was it a one, two, three, four, or five? And once I received the responses, I would ask them, well, why do you think this worked for you or didn't work for you? And have a quick chat about that. And if I wanna sweeten the pot and we have time, I'd ask them, well, what do you think we're going to learn next? This allows for communication, responsibility, and ownership of their learning. So now I wanna take you to the next activity. And that is if you had a lesson plan like this that you had to fulfill, how would you fill it out? What are the examples you would give? And what are the accompanying transferable skills that are incorporated? Okay, so I think we are actually running low on time. So I'm going to go ahead and move on, but I do encourage you if you'd like to go ahead and take a screenshot of this um, and that way maybe you can play with it a little bit later and, and think about it. So I'll give a few seconds there if you wanna take a, a photo of it. Technically we have six minutes more but uh, I would just uh, put the feedback link, uh, but please stay on for a little bit longer if you can. We started five minutes late, so if you can spare five minutes, please stay on. Thank you, Priyanka. Okay. So, and the last section is the classroom community. So now that we talked about building this partnership with the students, how do we take that partnership and build it into an entire classroom? We have to think about the fact that there are different types of learners, visual, auditory, tactile. We also have to think about the fact that there are different learning levels. There are gifted students and students that have other needs. And we also have to think about this idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and where they sit on that triangle and why. So what do we do with that? So what I tend to do in my classroom is I like to partner high and low learners together because it gives that opportunity for the low learner to relate to a peer about what they're struggling with instead of maybe me, I might be scary for them. I'd hope not, but maybe. And it gives that high learner a chance to challenge themselves in helping another student. I also like to do different team bonding and building exercises in my classroom, like doing partnered work, like checking in with each other. I think that those things are quite important, sharing experiences and asking for feedback. Another thought is to have the students write the classroom rules together. Actually ask them to sit down and say, this is your classroom too, not just mine. So what rules do you think need to happen in this class? The next is community mentality. I very much enjoy this. And what it is, is if one person succeeds in the class, then the whole class succeeded. And if one person acted out in class, then the whole class is disciplined as a result. I like that mentality because it allows the other students to celebrate each other for their successes, even through struggles and encourage them and motivate them but it also allows students to hold each other accountable. They can say, hey, you know, if you do that, the whole class is gonna get punished with something, whatever it is, whether it's I change all their seats to an arrangement they don't like, or um, we don't get to do a fun activity later in the day. And they, they hold each other accountable in that way. Lastly, I do like to treat students by giving them helper tasks. And that's really great for me. And that also helps with, with the bonding of of that student teacher partnership and that I have them pass out papers. I have them help me with attendance. I have them go and get the mail, whatever it is. And they, they like that. They do like that. 
So I did want to ask and have you consider how do you build community in your classroom? But again, as we're running out of time, unfortunately, I'm going to skip over this activity and press on, but do give it a, a think, please, and reflect on it in your own time. And then the last topic I really want to discuss is what happens when the classroom environment is disrupted. So I just have a quick couple of stories here. Um, two of them do relate to the pandemic, which we've all gone through. So that first lockdown that we faced, I was actually in South Africa, not China, but because I was in South Africa and I couldn't get out of South Africa and I needed an income, I agreed to teach online uh, to kids in China and I was paid in American dollars to do so. This kind of teaching took place with preset lesson plans. And it was interesting because it was the first time I got to teach online and it was during a pandemic. And particularly with China, they, they faced the real brunt of this pandemic um, in terms of what had actually happened and the social parts of it as well. So when I taught these kids, I found out very quickly that online teaching requires you to be a lot more engaging, a lot louder, a lot brighter, because you, you can't interact with them in person. So you have to be you have to use hand motions and smile and it takes longer for them to respond to you. So if you're asking a question and you're waiting for an answer and maybe they didn't understand you because of your accent or how quickly you're speaking, you do one of these and you sit there holding this face for a really long time while you wait, but you sit there and you wait because you need to let them know and give them that chance. So I learned that with the online teaching, you really have to have a sense of patience. And I'm sure you've also felt the same way. You had to change your teaching styles and you had to have the sense of patience and you had to find new creative ways to engage students and connect with them. So just a quick photo of what that looked like. <laughs> These were the preset lesson plans, the student and then the teacher. Um, my other student at the time was an honor student at the University of Cape Town and she was doing her master or her honors and it was part coursework, part dissertation. As a result of this pandemic, she couldn't finish her project. And so we had to actually recreate the whole thing about six months into her one year program. So you can imagine she was extremely stressed out. What also made it difficult working with her is that she was an elite student. So I had to figure out, well, what insight could I give her? So one of the things I ended up doing was I ended up giving her one of my projects that I was working on so that she could work on that. And because I had experience setting up that project, I was able to, to help her along the way with that. So that was a huge change in, in planning and scheduling. And I had to make that accommodation. So the second thing, the pandemic, taught me in this partnership is you have to be accommodating. So patience and accommodation. And this is actually us mid pandemic working in the field with um, these little shore, shore creatures. And then of course, currently in Sri Lanka as a VSPP for Peace Corps, I am co-teaching online with another teacher. Um, and you know it's a bit difficult because there is this reputation. I'm not just a Peace Corps volunteer anymore. I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer. And this is post pandemic. And as we all know, Sri Lanka is having its own issues right now. And how do we, how does this challenge and change learning? And what do we do? So one of the things that we really focus on is yes, we have patience. Yes, we have accommodation, but we also have a lot of forgiveness. We also have to recognize that students are trying to log in from home or from school or the signals out or the power is out or something is happening. There's a time change and we, we make it work. There's a lot of forgiveness and a lot of patience there as well. So one of the lessons that we did was to keep spirits up and things high is we had a cooking lesson and it was a cultural exchange of a snack that we often have in the US called ants in a log. And we talked about why it's called that and what the components are. But we had to have this additional prep work that we wouldn't have had to have in a classroom where we had to make sure all the students had access to these ingredients and the utensils to make this snack. And 
you know, a lot of the other things we did within the teaching was making sure that the students talking about what was happening currently in the country and how did that make them feel? And what can we do to make our, our lessons more fun and more engaging? What can we do just to give them that one hour of escape from everything that was happening around them? So a lot of forgiveness in the classroom. So I did wanna ask if you guys could share some of the things that you faced, some of the trials that you had as well, but again, we are running out of time. So uh, the last thing I wanna end on is once you create these bonds, how do we say goodbye? At the end of the year, after we've faced these issues together and we've succeeded and we've worked and we've built relationships, how do you say goodbye to these students? So some of the things I do for my older students is I always offer them recommendation letters. I'm very happy if they ever come back to my classroom or give me a, you know, a wave or a smile or an ad on social media. I know that that's usually frowned upon that you shouldn't have your students on social media, but I find after they've graduated or they're no longer my student, then that's when I'm okay with that. And especially as I'm traveling so much, they do like to see the new places I'm going to. And then with the younger students, a lot of times actually their parents like to send emails and photos of their kids. I had one student who scored his first hockey goal. So he wanted me to see that. So his mom sent some photos to me while I was in Ecuador and that was quite exciting to see. Or they tell me about the new things that they're learning and with their new teachers. So you keep in contact best you can. So I did wanna thank Peace Corps and the Sri Lankan Ministry of Education for the opportunity to chat to you today. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all the activities. Um, but yeah, I'll turn the floor back over to Priyanka. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Amanda, for bringing in this range of different aspects of the student-teacher uh, student relationship and the suggestions of how we might enhance that relationship using different ways and approaching this need. So Amanda, as you all know, is a virtual volunteer already working with students in Sri Lanka. So we feel so privileged to have your input into the, our series of uh, FET, Forum for English Teachers at this point in time, because I think uh, the timing is really very, very good for us. So we had our first session on blended learning and flipped classrooms. Our second was a workshop on speaking skills. And these were very focused on the teaching of English, which is exactly what Peace Corps is here to do in Sri Lanka, teach communicative English. But uh, Amanda, today you showed us that to learn anything, the student-teacher student relationship must be positive. And you have helped, helped us to focus on this important aspect of our teaching and learning. So when we intentionally use these thoughts, we will be able to impact the effectiveness of our classroom. So thank you, Amanda, for bringing our focus into this important area. So some of you were asking whether this will be recorded and it is recorded and our programs, all our programs will eventually be on YouTube, uh, eventually being the operative word here because I have not got the uh, last one on YouTube as yet, but it will be there. Please find us on Facebook and look out for the links to each session. So look for Peace Co Sri Lanka on Facebook and like us, and then you can find uh, the links to all these sessions. Okay, so uh, not taking too much time, let me wish each and every one of you good health and a positive mindset as you teach the children in this country, not only English, but to be global citizens with honesty, integrity, who can take over the leadership of our country and our world in the years to come.